Still, Lane struggled to wrench Morgan from her anger or to channel it in a better way, to be one with her higher self. Romulus, the name she'd given her higher self, was far from her now. She feared she would kill herself trying to wreak havoc on him, only to extract even the smallest of pains. But for whatever reason, she loved him, and she noticed he was drowning. Inside the water, as an eel, she saw her little girl self again, jumping in puddles in her wellies, the way she used to. The simple joy of being a child. That joy existed no matter what she felt. The shadows played on the surface of the water. She was far below an observer. She did some rearranging of her internal sitting room. She could shake loose of her burdens. She could try and try in small ways towards her goals. She was her best self when she had hope, even when she couldn't see a way through. She has bad eyesight, Lane said. Morgan's eyesight was at best twenty sixty. That's why she said her eyes weren't so good at seeing. She couldn't see what was right in front of her, but she could see a long ways behind and seemingly into the future. And that foresight was helpful. Still, telling Kakolin her only weakness left her wide open. Sometimes she could be self-sacrificing to a fault. Ow, my eye, she said, feeling the pain even before it had been pierced. She writhed in the mire, trying to dam up her rage with the blood he'd spilled from her. She had to bottle her scream. Through the movement of the water, she felt him take advantage of her blind spot, her innocence. Why'd he have to pry his blade straight into her eel eye, which was already so weak? She squinted at the resounding light that looked more like darkness. The pressure knocked her backwards off what she thought was stable footing, hurting her but opening her senses. She surfaced for an instant and took a deep breath. Gather your strength and just keep going, she told herself. Fai un respiro profundo. When she did so, she transformed once more from the slimy water creature to her human form. She could finally accept herself. Her imperfections made her her. She was transforming in small ways each day, which would ultimately lead to her ultimate transmorphosis. Writing things out seemed to help. Artists experienced things in a different way, and it inspired their work. All time stopped. She could see everything, her vision repaired, through the outline of the trees reflected on the surface of the water above her. Life as an eel had been beautiful, she realized. When the snow began to fall, the water was hard to swim through. It grew cloudy. In the icy water, she'd grown fearful. This fear made her recoil, like in the second grade. She had turned her desk upside down because the teacher wouldn't let her watch TV with the rest of the class. Dad was drinking at home and her parents were fighting. She could see the glare from the wheeled in TV the teacher brought, shining in blue and purple streaks across the carpet. Dad spit his chew on the carpet at home. They had an orange couch. She was like many other kids with behavioral issues who were just misunderstood. Mom spent more time with her and she passed the second grade. Now Lane was working at the elementary school with kids who were just like the kid she had been. Kids with family issues and complicated emotions. It was like she was inviting her child self to tea. 
She was staring at the six-year-old version of her, wearing her puffy pastel coat, her leggings with the polka dots Mom had made on the sewing machine. Her cousins were taking her to that big water tower close to where they lived, with the zoo animals painted on it. She heard some encouraging words that helped her through her first week in the substitute position. Sometimes you just have to survive, Mom said, and try not to do anything you'll regret later. If they're acting up, it's probably just because they're having problems at home. She imagined what the kids at the school would look like when they were high schoolers or young adults. At the same time, she remembered what she was like as a little girl. Dad drove truck. One day she escaped the confines of her bedroom and wandered down the street until she met some teenagers. Guess she had the spirit of adventure even then. But when they brought her home, Dad wasn't happy. He made her stay in for the rest of the night. And later on, after they'd moved, Mom took her to the bar where he drank. He looked regretful, but could not leave his bar stool. Lane hugged him and they left. Curse was maledizione in Italian, and anyone could turn around what had cursed their family, whether it was addiction or something else. Not all family traditions were meant to be savored. There was nothing she could do about the past that had already happened, but if she kept moving in the right direction... Maybe she could change the habits of future generations. Something she read said, You're good at teaching, counseling, and helping children. Use your skills to help children now. It's a difficult class, the school secretary said. It was, but she got through the day somehow. The little girls inched closer to her on the rug. Even though they didn't listen to her, they picked at her folder and looked up at her until her legs went numb and she had to stand up and shake the life back into them. Strong Kirsi Legambe was to have one's legs fall asleep in Italian. No, actually it meant to stretch one's legs, just like she was being stretched at the time. She was some kind of gentle leader. Not the little girl kids picked on at school. Now she was an adult, called on for her bravery and more powerful than she knew. Those that viewed her as feeble and unsuccessful did not know her true strength, her faithfulness, and enduring nature. She tried to learn all their names, the names of the kids at the school, even when they ripped their name tags off repeatedly. On the bus, her backpack was splitting apart at the seams. The bus driver let her go on without paying. 
She felt this supernatural peace and calm overtake her, and the confusion fled. She even saw a seagull in the sky. She felt like a vital part of the collective. She'd somehow make it through. There was a song playing in the grocery store. You color my world, you color my world. Impact, environment, and responsibility were the words of the day. She saw many signs throughout the day that offered her hope, like the octopus, that made her think a miracle might happen with her business, and she'd be able to generate an additional small cash flow. Maybe Italy was a possibility someday, as she saw the screensaver on her laptop at work of Lake Puccini and another of Cicada Peak. Maybe she could be successful largely due to her ability to be innovative. She was a dynamic, ever-changing person, and eventually her cheerfulness, courage, and resolution would get her to where she wanted to be, a leader of passion and purpose. She knew she had to keep going, and each day she'd wake up renewed and full of hope. She was like a swan on the water holding the current at bay, or like a designer directing a piece of fabric under an industrial sewing machine. Even with the trenchant motion, there was the steadiness of her purpose underneath. She felt completely sealed off from any past part of her life that had caused her harm. It was sealed away from her current life like a pocket in a great quilt her mom had made by hand. She added extra backing so it would never be reopened. Or maybe this was a time she would be blessed with extra backing. She didn't know where it would come from, but had a feeling it would come. Tista bene was, it fits you well, this new life and new version of herself.